episode 37. This is the last episode of the uh, new material uh, in our course. We have one more episode after this that'll be a review for the final exam. Um, and uh, let's look at our list of objectives here for episode 38. First of all, we want to look at terminology for probability, and then we'll look at ver various applications of probability. Uh, we'll look at a formal definition for probability, and we'll introduce several probability formulas, and, and then we'll look again at some more applications. Okay, if we go to the very first, uh, to the next graphic, we'll introduce some fundamental terminology here uh, for probability. Uh, first of all, we want to define an experiment, and an experiment is an activity that has observable outcomes. So in other words, uh, rolling dice, uh, drawing a card from a deck of cards, um, uh, choosing, uh, choosing a number out of a box, something like that. Th those would be the observable outcomes that we could have. Flipping a coin, I see Jeff back here signaling flipping a coin, of course. As a matter of fact, that's what our first example is gonna be about. Now, if you take, a, if you take the set of all uh, outcomes, that's referred to as the sample space, the sample space S. Uh, and an event uh, is any subset of the sample space. So for example, if you flip a coin, uh, the sample space would be a head or a tail, and an event might be just the head. That is, uh, could you flip a head with a set of, with a, with a coin? Okay, now if we have two different events, E1 and E2, those are said to be independent if they have nothing in common. So for example, if you roll a die and if you flip a coin, those are independent events because rolling the die has no effect on the outcome of flipping a coin. And finally, the way that we calculate the probability uh, is if we have equally likely outcomes, then the probability of an event, we'll call that P of E, um, is the ratio of the number of elements in the event divided by the number of elements in the sample space. So I've abbreviated that as N of E divided by N of S. Okay, let's go to the next graphic and we'll, we'll take a closer look at these terms in a specific uh, experiment. Okay, suppose we have an experiment in which we want to flip a coin twice. Well, the sample space, which is the set of all outcomes, uh, would be that we could get two heads, H, H, or we could get a head and a tail, that is uh, H, T, or we could get a tail and then a head, T, H, or two tails. Now you notice that we're counting H, T, and T, H separately because if they're two coins, the first coin could be heads and the second coin tail, or the first coin could be tail and the second coin head. So we, so we, we count those twice. We don't count that just as one outcome. Now an event, uh, is a subset of the sample space. And let's describe our event in words by saying we're going to flip a coin twice and we want to flip at least one heads. Well, if I look at the members of the sample space, there are only three members in which we get at least one heads. That would be HH, HT, and TH. Two heads, a head and a tail, or a tail and a head. And the probability uh, is going to be 3 over 4. Now you notice I call this the theoretical probability. P of E is equal to 3 over 4. Uh, this is the number of elements in the event. There are three elements in the event. Uh, divided by uh, four elements in the sample space. Uh, now I call this the theoretical probability. And the reason is that if you actually flip a coin four times, there's no guarantee that you'll, or rather if you flip a coin twice, and if you do this four times in a row, there's no guarantee that you'll ever get ahead in all of those flips. But theoretically, in the long run, that is if you did this for thousands or hundreds of thousands of times, that uh, three out of four times that you flip a coin twice, you would expect to see uh, at least one head. Now compare that with what I call the experimental probability right here. What is the experimental probability of flipping at least one head based on the following uh, observations? And that is, suppose that we get uh, two heads, a head and a tail. Let's go back to that graphic so we can see that. Uh, a head and a head, a tail and a tail, a tail and a head, and a head and a tail. So in other words, if we actually flipped uh, a coin twice and we did this six times, what if these were the observations that we made? Then my, uh, based on this experiment, the probability of us getting um, at least one head would be, let's see, one, two, three, four, four out of six. 
So if we go to the green screen, I would say that the experimental probability would be, let's see, out of six observations, four of those did I get at least one head, and that turns out to be two-thirds. Whereas we said the theoretical, pro the theoretical probability was three out of four. And so there's no reason to expect that based on that experiment of only six uh, times that we flipped a coin twice, there's no reason to expect that we would see exactly three fours. As a matter of fact, if we flipped uh, a coin twice six times, there's no way I could make that ratio be three over four if I have an integer over an integer. But uh, this is what I see based on the experiment, and this is what I theoretically would find overall. Now, for example, if you were a bowler and someone asked you, what's the probability that on the next roll of the ball that you'll roll a strike? Well, you're you, the, the way you would estimate that probability would be based upon your previous experiment, and that would be something like looking at these six outcomes uh, here, and th there's no way that you could theoretically predict what is the probability that on your next roll that you would get um, a strike, except to be uh, based on a sample of data like we just had there in the experimental probability. Okay, um, in this example, we ask, what is the probability of flipping a penny, a nickel, and a dime once each and getting two heads and one tail? Well, let's see. First of all, let's try working this out by listing the individual cases, and then we'll see if there's a shortcut for computing this. Uh, I'm thinking that to begin with, uh, if we have a penny, a nickel, and a dime, let's see, the penny, the nickel, and the dime, Okay, so uh, I guess we could start off by getting uh, heads, heads, and heads. Or we could get heads, heads, and then tails on the dime. Now, let's see, that's one tail. Suppose I move that tail through this list. Suppose we have heads, tails, heads. So now I still have one tails, but it's for the nickel. And then I have tails, heads, heads. So we've covered the case where we have all heads, and we've covered the three cases where we have one tail. Now, uh, the next, I guess, I guess to continue this list, what if we had two tails? And if we had two tails, that would mean one head. So suppose we were to put tails, tails, and one head on the end, and then I move that head through, tails, heads, tails, and then I move it further through, heads, tails, tails. So now these last three, you notice we have uh, two tails, or equivalently one heads. So let's see, we have three heads, then we did these three where we had uh, two heads, then we did these three where we had one head, and then finally, what if we had no heads at all? That would be all tails, 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 and tails. So I think this covers all the possible outcomes that we could have when we flip a penny, a nickel, and a dime. So it looks like there's a total of eight outcomes, and I would say these are all equally likely. I don't see that any one of those would be any more likely than any other. Um, so it looks like our total number of outcomes is eight, so that would be the number of elements in the sample space appears to be eight. Now, the event was that we were going to get two heads and one tails, and I think those are, are listed right here in this group, two heads and one tails. So the number of elements in the event is equal to three, and therefore the probability for this event to occur would be the number of elements in the event divided by the number of elements in the sample space, and that would be three over eight. So the, what we've determined here is that theoretically, the probability of flipping a penny, a nickel, and dime and getting two heads and a tail is three over eight. And to interpret this in another way, if I were to flip, if I were to do this eight times, flip a penny, a nickel, and a dime, we would generally expect that three of those eight times, we would have two heads and one tail. Okay, uh, what would be the probability of flipping all heads in this case? One out of eight? One out of, one out of eight in this case, right. Now, you know, I might abbreviate that one by just calling it H, H, H. And you notice that for this event, three heads, there's only one way that can happen. That would be on this first line. So that would be one over, and once again, in the sample space, there were eight outcomes. So one out of eight in, in that case. Exactly. Okay, now, um, there is some 
some uh, abbreviation for some of the notation that I'm using, and it comes from some information you've seen previously in other courses on unions and intersections. Let's go to this next graphic, and we can just review what that information is about. Uh, you may recall that, uh, let's see if you can show my hand on this screen. Okay, you may recall that if you put this symbol, uh, the union symbol between two sets, A and B, that the union of A and B, the union of A and B, is the set of all elements X, such that X belongs to A or X belongs to B. And so if this circle represents A and this circle represents B, and they possibly overlap right here in the middle, then if I were to shade in A union B, I would shade in the whole thing. That's why this entire, uh, this entire uh, graph here is shaded in as red, because it represents the union. And I think what's significant here is the word, the symbol, the symbol, and the word for union uh, go with the word or. X is in A or X is in B. If X is in A or if X is in B, then X is in this shaded region, A union B. Now on the other hand, if I invert that symbol, this refers to the intersection of the two sets. And the intersection of A and B is the set of all X such that x belongs to A and x belongs to B. So x, x is, in the, is in the intersection, such as the intersection of two streets. And uh, if this is set A and if this is set B, then the intersection is what they have in common. And I want to point out that the symbol for intersection is associated with the word and. So if the U opens up, if the symbol opens up, the union will use an R, and if it opens down, we'll use an and. Now, you'll see this in some of, the, uh, some of the problems that come up in just a moment. Okay, let's go to the next graphic. And consider a new problem, and I'll use some of the union and intersection notation as I explain this. Uh, it says a ball is drawn at, grand at random from a Grecian urn containing, uh, I don't know why it has to be Grecian, but it just seemed appropriate, uh, containing six balls. Now there's one red ball, two green balls, and three yellow balls. So if the ball selected is green, then we want to know what is the probability, uh, what is the probability that the ball selected will be green? I, I guess I should say it, the probability it will be green. Now I think we can assume that if we're drawing these balls at random, what that means is that the outcomes of choosing uh, one of the red balls, or the red ball, or one of the two green balls, or one of the three yellow balls, they're all equally likely to come up. Now, if you look at the green balls in total, it's more, it's more likely that you'll pick a green ball than a red one. But if you look at the green balls separately, they, we could choose one of those just as likely as we would choose the red ball. So we want to know what is the probability that when you do this at random, you'll choose a green ball. Well, let's see. It looks like there are six possible outcomes. So um, we'll put a six in the denominator. And there's only one outcome in which a ball is, is uh, no, there are two outcomes where the ball is green. So that'll be two over six, or that reduces to be one third. Now what that means is that in the long run, if I did this experiment many times, selecting a ball out of the urn and then replacing it, I would expect that one out of every three times I would pick a green ball, more or less. Um, and uh, now we may actually perform this experiment and we may choose a ball uh, three times out of the six and then replace it, mix them up and choose another ball again. And we may never pick a green ball or we may always pick a green ball. But in the long run, we think that one out of three times we should pick a green ball. Okay, now suppose we want to know the probability that the ball selected is not green. And the way I'll abbreviate this, I'll, I'll put a little negative sign in front of the green, but I've, I've made it sort of wiggly here so it doesn't look like a subtraction sign or a true negative sign. But if you see a mark such as this, like in our textbook, uh, that means that it's not going to be green. You know, there's another way to represent this, and that would be to put a bar over it. And in some textbooks, you'll see, um, you'll see a bar drawn above drawn above that, and, and if you see a bar over the, the term, that means that it's not green rather than that it is green. And uh, finally, in some textbooks, you see a little prime, a little apostrophe mark behind the G or after the G, and that means that rather than being green, it's not green. That's sort of the, the negation of the G. Well, let's see. Now, what's the probability that the ball selected is not green? Well, there are six possible outcomes. 
and it looks like there are four ways I can choose a ball that's not green. There's one red and there's three yellow. So there are four ways I can choose a ball that's, that's not green and they're all equally likely so I can take the ratio of these two and I get two thirds. By the way, what's the sum of the two answers that I've gotten here? Well, one third and two thirds adds up to be one. So what that tells me, what that suggests is another way to determine that the ball is not green is that I could just take one minus the probability that it is green. Uh, and so one minus a third would have been two thirds. So we could have worked the problem uh, in that form as well. Okay, finally, there's a third question here. And this says, suppose we want to know the probability that the ball chosen is both green and yellow. So the probability that it's both green and yellow. Uh, now you notice the way this has been abbreviated here is I'm putting in an intersection sign, G for green, Y for yellow, and the intersection sign is associated with the word and, so G intersect Y is, uh, represents the, the, the possibility that the ball could be green and yellow. Now once again there are six possible outcomes, but in no case can I pick one ball that's both green and yellow, so there are zero possibilities there, and therefore Here's an experiment, here's, a, here's, a, uh, here's an event in which the probability is zero. And we'll interpret that to mean it's just impossible. Okay, so uh, some of the ideas that we brought up here are summarized in four laws on pro of probability that we bring up in the next uh, graphic. Okay, law number one says that the probability that uh, event E does not occur is one minus the probability that event E does occur. Or if you put these two together, if you add uh, P of E and P of negative E, these two add up to be one. Uh, now the largest that a probability can be is one, and that means that it's a sure thing. And if I subtract the probability of E, then I'll have the probability that E does not occur. Law number two, the probability of E is zero means what? means it's impossible, yeah. If we're talking about uh, an experiment in which there are finitely many outcomes, if the probability is zero, then it's impossible, such as choosing a ball that's both green and yellow. And if the probability of E is one, we just mentioned this a moment ago, what does that mean? It's a sure thing. Means it's a sure thing, yeah. So for example, uh, in the six balls in the urn, if we ask what's the probability that when you choose a ball, it will be red, green, or yellow? Well, that's a sure thing because uh, that's the only kind of balls that were in the urn. And finally, for any event E, the probability of E has to be greater than or equal to zero or less than or equal to one. So we know that if we ever come up with a probability that's negative or if we come up with a probability that's more than one, we know that there's something wrong because all of these answers are going to be between zero and one. Okay, let's go to the next graphic and we'll look at another probability problem. Suppose we draw a card from an ordinary deck of 52 cards, and we ask several questions about what may happen. Now, for those of you who aren't familiar with a deck of cards, let me just explain uh, uh, what a deck of cards looks like and uh, what some of the terms mean. Now, here I have um, here I have a deck of uh, an ordinary deck of cards, and that would be 52 cards, and there are four suits. So, for example, uh, that's the four of what? What suit is that? Clubs, okay, and this is the two of spades. spades, okay, and here is a five of diamonds, yes, and now here is another two, that's the two of hearts, hearts. okay. These are the four suits, and we have 13 cards in each suit, in, in each of the suits. For example, uh, let's take um, the suit of clubs, for example. The smallest club is the uh, two of clubs. Let me see if I can find the two of clubs here. And, oh, it's the very last card, wouldn't you know it? Okay, that's usually considered the smallest card. And then the biggest card would be the ace of clubs. So I'll put the ace over here. And the cards go two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. And then we come to the three face cards. There's, uh, there's the jack, there's the, the queen, and there's the king. Those are called the three face cards. Now you know there are some games in which the ace is considered a one and you put it over here. It's the smallest value card, but I think in most games ace is considered a high card rather than a low card. So uh, we have 13 cards in each suit and these three cards in the suit are referred to as the face cards. So 
let's see, let me just kind of summarize some of this information here. Uh, we said that there were four suits. There were four suits. There are the, the clubs. There are the diamonds. There are the hearts. And there are the spades. And on the club, you see uh, a symbol sort of like this to represent the club. On the diamond, the diamonds are red, by the way, clubs are black. Uh, for the hearts, you see a shape like this. And for the spade, it's sort of an inverted heart, uh, but it's also black. So this one is black, the clubs are black, the spades are black, the diamonds are red, and the hearts are red. Now, I point this out because in some of your homework problems, they'll ask something about uh, perhaps uh, the probability of drawing a red card or uh, a red face card, something like that. Okay, now, within each suit, we have the arrangement of cards that goes like this. There's the two, the three, the four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, and then we come to the three face cards, the jack, the queen, the king, and then there's the ace. Ace isn't considered a face card. It doesn't have a face on it. And, uh, you know, this, I think the, the reasoning behind the jack, the queen, and the king comes from medieval um, uh, courtly life. There was the king, the queen, and then the jack was the heir apparent to the throne. So those were the, those were the three face cards uh, originally as they were designated. Okay, now let's go back to our problem and answer some questions about a deck of cards. Suppose we draw a card at random from an ordinary deck of cards, and you see the ordinary deck of 52, and you see 52 is 4 times 13. We have four suits, 13 cards in each suit. What is the probability that the, heart, that the card is a heart? Well, let's see. Um, would you say that the, that the choices of picking a card at random, uh, you think it's equally likely that you'd pick a heart or a spade or a club? Yes. yes. Yeah, so these are all equally likely um, uh, outcomes. And therefore, if our event is to pick a heart, I should put the number of hearts divided by the number of cards in the deck. Now, how many hearts are there? 13. 13, and how many cards are there? 52. So we'll put 13 over 52. Let's come to the green board so I can write that down. So uh, the probability that we could draw a heart is uh, 13 hearts to choose from, 52 cards in the deck. Now that reduces to be what? One fourth. One over four. Now you notice in this case, what I have is one suit divided by four suits, and it, the the suits come up equally likely. There's one suit out of four suits. Are there 13 hearts out of 52 cards? Uh, I think when you're working the problem, this is probably the way you would interpret it. But then you'd want to reduce your answer to be one fourth. You wouldn't want to leave it as 13 over 52 when you could get a such a nice answer as one fourth. Okay, let's go back to the graphic and look at the next question. Now we want to know in part B, uh, what is the probability that the card is a face card? That is a jack, a queen, or a king. Well, let's see. The probability that we get a face card, I'll just write the word face in there to abbreviate that event, uh, is going to be something over 52. Now let's see. There are how many jacks? Four. Four, four jacks. There are four queens. There are four kings. So how many face cards are there? Twelve. Twelve. Okay. So... Let's, let's go back to the green screen. Okay, so that'll be 12 over 52, and that reduces also. Now, what will divide 12 and 52? Four. Uh, four will, and that gives me three over 13. Now, let me ask you this. If you had a choice of, from a, from a shuffle deck of cards, picking a card, what do you think would be more likely, that you would pick a heart or that you would pick a face card? A heart. A heart. Yeah, Stephen, why do you say a heart? Because um, one fourth or thirteen over fifty-two is greater than three thirteenths or twelve over fifty-two. Exactly. Right. There are thirteen ways out of fifty-two a heart can be drawn. Only twelve ways a face card can be done. But you know those are fairly close together, aren't they? They're almost the same. But in the long run, you would probably pick a heart a little bit more often than you would pick a face card.
Now, of course, if you sat at home and you, you did this three times and you picked a card at random, put it back into the deck, shuffled it, pick a card at random, put it back in the deck, it could be that in the, in the short haul, as they say, you might pick a face card more often than a heart. But in the long run, the hearts are going to win out. Now, you know, this is exactly how gambling games work. Say if you go to Las Vegas or Atlantic City or to a casino, it's possible that in the short term you could win at the game if you're playing blackjack or craps or playing a slot machine. But in the long run, the, shall we say, the law of averages takes over, and in the long run you generally don't win at those games. But in the short term you could. You could have a lucky streak. Or you could be really unlucky and never win a cent. But, uh, but in the long run, th I think the casino figures that they're, they're, going to, uh, they're going to win some money from you. Okay, let's go back to the graphic look at part C. Uh, suppose that the card you choose is a heart and a face card at the same time. What's the probability that that would happen? Now, I'm going to abbreviate this on the green screen as H intersect F. Of course, H is for heart, F is for face card. What does the intersection sign mean? And. It means the word and, yes. If you think back to our Venn diagrams and our discussion of unions and intersections a moment ago. So this means uh, heart and face card. Now, if you prefer, you could write this as H and F. But I'm pointing this out because in the textbook, you're going to see this symbol on some problems. Okay, now, a heart and a face card. Well, let's see, there are 52 choices still. Now, in how many ways can I pick a heart and a face card at the same time? Three. Three ways, yeah. Now, someone may say, well, Dennis, you, you can only pick one card. It, they can't both happen. Sure they can. What if you pick the jack of hearts, the queen of hearts, or the king of hearts? You could pick a heart and a face card at the same time. But there are only three ways that can happen. And 3 and 52 don't reduce, so I'll have to leave it like that. So you see, this is considerably less likely than just picking a heart or just picking a face card, that both of those would happen. Okay, and one more question on the graphic. Okay, now, if you look at uh, line D, it says the card, this time we want to know what is the probability the card is either a heart or a face card. Well, let's see, the way I'm going to abbreviate that is to say uh, P of H union F, because you remember union is associated with the word or, intersection is associated with the word and. Uh, and so in this case, let's see, there are 52 choices. Now in how many ways can I choose a heart? Well, let's see, there are 13 ways I can choose a heart. And in how many ways can I choose a face card? 12. 12. So if I add those two together, uh, a person might say, well then Dennis, there must be 25 ways you can pick a heart or a face card. But you know, we've actually counted some things twice here uh, because there are some hearts that are also face cards. So rather than counting them twice, we better subtract off the duplications. How many times do I pick a card that's a heart and a face card at the same time? There's three. Three times, okay. So what I have is 13 plus 12 and then I remove the duplicates and this gives me uh, 22 over 52, which is 11 over 26. Now, in this last example, let me just show you uh, how this leads to a law of probability. And it says that if I write this as 13 over 52, that's the probability of choosing a heart. And if I add on 12 over 52, that's the probability that I choose a face card. Then I have to subtract off the probability that I choose a heart and a face card, H intersect F. Yeah, let's see, 13 over 52, that's the probability of picking a heart. 12 over 52 is the probability of picking a face card. But I have to remove the duplication, which means I'm removing the, the that is the probability of choosing a heart and a face card. So the probability of the H or F is the probability of H plus the probability of F minus the probability of H and F. We're going to see this now in the next graphic when we state two more laws of probability. <coughs> In the first case, it says, uh, law number five says that if events, uh, we'll call them E and F, are independent events, remember that means they have nothing in common, such as uh, rolling a die and flipping a coin, so that those are independent, the outcome of one has no effect on the other, then the probability of P and F happening is simply the probability of E times the probability of F. That's a, that's a product there. So we're multiplying two probabilities together. Now the law that I've just mentioned is the probability that E or F happens. 
is the probability of E plus the probability of F minus the probability of E and F happening at the same time. And the reason we subtract that off is because this gets rid of any duplication. Now suppose E and F have no duplication, suppose these are independent events, then what I would be doing here is, um, well excuse me, not independent, but suppose they don't overlap, then the probability of their intersection is zero, Man. and in that case it's just the probability of E plus the probability of F. Okay, I think it's time to look at something other than cards. Let's go to another experiment. And hey, why don't we go to rolling dice? There's another interesting problem. So uh, the question is, what is the probability of rolling a sum of seven with a pair of dice? And then I ask some other questions after that, but let's consider the first one of seven. Now, you know, on a die, uh, on, a, on a pair of dice, one, one die has how many faces? Six. There are six faces. Yeah, so like if this represents one die, if there's a little dot there, of course, that means one. If I put two dots over here, that means two. And if I put three dots diagonally across there, that means three. So in other words, on the back sides, we'd see four, five, and six. Uh, I don't know if you're aware of this, but the numbers on opposite faces of a die total seven. So the number on the back side directly behind the one should be a six. What number would you guess... What number of dots do you think would be on the bottom of the die? Four. Four, yeah, because the top and the bottom numbers always had to be seven. And on the left and the right side, they had to be seven, so there must be a five over on this side. So there are six outcomes on the die. Uh, and they're all equally likely. We're assuming this isn't a loaded die, so when you roll it, it's equally likely that you get one through, one through six. Now the question is, what is the probability of rolling uh, a pair of dice and getting a sum of seven? Well, now, with a pair of dice, the outcomes of the total are not equally likely. Let's see what they could be. Uh, I could roll uh, a, whoops, let's see, too high there, a 1 and a 1, or a 1 and a 2, that'd be a total of 3, a 1 and a 3, 1 and 4, 1, 5, 1, and 6. By the way, when you roll a 1 and a 1, what do they call that in dice? Snake, Snake eyes. eyes. Snake eyes, yeah, it's supposed to look like two beady eyes looking, looking at you, I guess, out of a a hole in the ground or a tunnel. Now you could also roll a two and a one, a two and a two, two and a three, two and a four, two five, and two six. Now you notice I'm counting two one differently from one two because we have two dice and let's say one's green and one's red. This one might say the first, the green one comes up one, the red one two. This one says the green one comes up two, the red one one. So those are considered different outcomes. Now we also have three one, three two, three three, 3, 4, 3, 5, 3, 6. This is where the first die comes up with a 3 on it, obviously. And then 4, 1, 4, 2, 4, 3, 4, 4, 4, 5, 4, 6. So when you come up with 4 and 6, that means you've rolled a total of 10. Uh, then there's 5, 1, 5, 2, etc. I'll just write the other possibilities down here. And then there's 6, 1, 6, 2, all the way down to, now what's the, number, what's the name we give to a pair of sixes? What do they call that? Twelve. Well, they, they do, <laughs> they, very good. They, they do call that twelve sometimes. Uh, and there is another name, kind of like a, a pair of uh, ones is called snake eyes. A pair of sixes is sometimes called boxcars. I guess because the sixes, the way the dots are lined up, they look like the top and bottom of, a, of two boxcars on a, on a train. Okay, now how many outcomes are there when you roll a pair of dice? 36. How many distinct outcomes here? We have 36 outcomes, and I, I've listed these separately so that these will all be equally likely. There's no more likelihood that you'd roll a pair of fives from rolling a four and a six. Although, if you want to roll a 10, there, there are three ways to roll a 10. There's a four, six, a five, five, and there's a six, four. Now, in how many ways can you roll a total of seven with a pair of dice? Well, let's see, here's a, here's a seven right here a one and a six, but there's also a two and a five, and there's also a three and a four, and a four and a three, and a five and a two, and a six and a one. How many ways can I roll a seven with a pair of dice? Six. Six. So if I want to compute the, possibility, the probability that I roll a sum of seven, not rolling an individual die to get seven, uh, that's going to be six out of 36, or one over six. Not very likely, but you know what? Seven is the most likely thing you can roll with a pair of dice. 
because uh, take sixes, for example, in how many ways can you roll a six? There's one, and here's one. All together, how many ways can you roll a six? Five. five. Only five ways, five out of 36. So you notice that the longest diagonal has six in it. There are five ways to roll a six. There are four ways to roll a five. There are three ways to roll a four. There are two ways to roll a three. And of course, there's only one way to roll a total of two. So seven is the most likely, is the most likely roll. Okay, now there's another question though up here, and it says, what is more likely, rolling a sum of either 7 or 11, or rolling a sum of either 2, 3, or 12? Now some people might say, oh, I would pick the 2, 3, or 12 because you have more possibilities. You have 2, 3, or 12. You have three different possibilities. Over here there are only uh, two possibilities. But of course that wouldn't be, that wouldn't be very sound reasoning. Um, what is the probability of rolling a 7 or 11? Well, let's see. How many ways can I roll a seven? Six ways. Six ways. How many ways can I roll an 11? Two. Two. Two ways. That's a total of eight ways. By the way, those don't overlap, do they? You can't roll a seven and an 11 at the same time. Those would be independent events. So there are, there are uh, whoops, six plus two out of 36 ways to roll a seven or 11. That's going to be eight out of 36. Okay, now let's see. Will this still fit on the screen? I think it will. What's the probability of rolling a 2, a 3, or a 12? Well, once again, it's going to be something over 36. How many ways can you roll a 2? One way. One way. I'll put a box around that one. How many ways can you roll a 3? Two ways. Two ways, yeah. And how many ways can you roll a 12? One. Only one way over here. So there are only four ways I can roll a 2, 3, or 12. So that's 4 out of 36. Okay, so let's see, 4 out of 36. Now, let's just reduce these further. Uh, the 8 out of 36 reduces to be 2 over 9. The 4 out of 36 reduces to be 1 over 9. So it looks like it's twice as likely that you roll a 7 or 11 as opposed to a 2, 3, or 12. Now, do you know where this question comes from, actually? You know why I'm asking about these particular numbers? Going to Vegas? If you go to Vegas, <laughs> right, and if you roll dice, if you shoot craps, as they say, on the first roll of the dice, uh, if you roll a 7 or 11, you win. And if you roll a 2, 3, or 12, you lose. You say, well, hey, I love that game. Uh, I've got twice as good a chance of winning as losing. But you notice, what is the sum of two ninths and one ninth? Three, it's one three third. ninths or one third. So what's going to happen the other two thirds of a time? Or, or what's going to happen the other two thirds of, all, of the times you roll? Well, you don't actually lose, but what happens is you, ro you don't roll a 7 or 11 or a 2, 3, or 12. And what happens in the game of craps is whatever you roll uh, other than 7, 11, 2, 3, or 12, that's called your point. And after that, you get the dice back and you have to roll again. And you have to keep rolling until you roll your point again. So, for example, if your point is a 5, you keep rolling the dice until you roll a 5. Or you roll a 7, and now 7 is a killer. And if you roll a seven, you lose, you don't win. So seven's a winner on the first roll. And 11's a winner. Two, three, and 12 are losers. But most of the time what happens is you don't roll any of these numbers. You roll some other number, and that's called your point. And then you get the dice back and you roll some more until you roll your point again, or you roll a seven. And now it's more likely that you roll a seven than anything else. So on the second and subsequent rolls, the probability is really poor now that you're going to win after that. So I think you're enticed into shooting craps, thinking that on the first roll you have twice as good a chance of winning as losing, but that's only on the first roll. On the rolls after that, the probability is significantly uh, poorer that you're going to win. Okay, so much for that. Let's go to the next graphic. Uh, here's sort of a geometrical look at probability. What is the probability that we hit a bullseye, that's the, that inner gray circle, when we randomly hit the target shown to the right? Now, what I've shown you there is the radius. The inner circle has radius 1, and the outer circle has radius 3. And we want to know the probability that, assuming you hit the target at random, uh, that you will land in the inner circle. Now, of course, if you're throwing darts at a dartboard, things aren't random. Number one, you don't always hit the dartboard. At least I don't. And number two, if you're guiding the dart, then hopefully you have a little bit of influence on where the dart lands. 
But if you were to just, uh, say, toss a dart out there at random and it hits the board, what's the probability that you'd hit the target? Well, you know, in this case, you could say, well, now, Dennis, there are actually infinitely many different places you could land inside the circle. There's infinitely many different points. And in the big circle, there are infinitely many points that, where you could land. So how can you take a ratio of the number of points on the inside versus the number of points possible in the entire circle? Well, I agree. In this case, you can't actually do this by counting the number of outcomes. But instead, we do it based on area. So in a problem like this, we would say the probability of hitting a bullseye will be determined by the area of the bullseye divided by, well, what would you guess? The area of the whole the target. A, the area of the entire target, right, exactly. So you see, what I'm doing is I'm reducing the problem to area rather than trying to count points, because there's no way you can count up infinitely many points across there. Um, well, let's see. This means we have to know a formula for the area of a circle. Uh, let's just put that over here. Um, let's see. The area of a circle is, um, let me move that in a little bit. The area of a circle is... Um, R pi r squared, right, pi r squared, pi times the radius squared. So um, the area for the target would be pi times 3 squared, because that's its radius. And the area for the bullseye is pi times 1 squared. And if I take this ratio, the pi's cancel off, and what I have then is uh, 1 over 9. So the probability that if you just randomly throw a dart at the board and it hits the board, only one out of nine times will you get a bullseye. You know, another way of thinking of, about this is what if this, were, um, what if this were a tile on the floor and what if you were just tossing pennies or uh, stones or whatever and they just bounce into the target at random. Um, now, that's, that's the important thing, is they arrive at random. Then the probability that the coin or the stone uh, would ally in the inner circle is 1 in 9. The probability is 1 out of 9 that it would land there. Uh, Stephen? Kind of like if you, set the tiger, if you set the target out and raindrops fell on it. How oh, many exactly. Yeah, that would be a good example. Right. So uh, if, if, you were, if it was getting ready to rain and a raindrop landed on the target, uh, what's the probability the first drop would land in the bullseye or in the inner circle? And that would be one out of nine, exactly. Okay, well, you know, as you can see, I think, from the variety of these examples, that, that probability is a very broad subject. And um, we're just looking at the rudiments of probability, and we're trying to do so by looking at a variety of problems that I think are, are interesting um, and uh, uh, that we are considering here. Let's go to the next problem. What is the probability that two of the members of this class, uh, that's including me, have the same birthday? The probability of the same birthday. Well, now this, this is uh, getting a bit more complicated. Um, I think the way we should handle this is decide what's the probability that no two of us have the same birthday. And then, if we look at the complement of that, that'll be the probability that two of us do have the same birthday. Okay, so to begin with, I'm going to ask this question. Uh, what is the probability that we have different birthdays? Now, there are five students in the room plus me, so there's six of us all, all together. And we want to know the probability that we have different uh, birthdays. Well, let's see. Now, uh, let's begin with me. I have, my, my birthday is August the 18th. Now, what's the probability that your birthday is different than mine? Well, there are 365 days a year. I'm, I'm going to leave out leap year. Let's, let's avoid that issue. Um, February 29th. So what is the probability that your birthday out of 365 days is different than mine? Seems like it'd be 364 out of 365. Okay. So... Um, I'm going to write down 364 out of 365. So that's the probability that if I ask David here, David, what's your birthday? Is it different than mine? Of course, it's very likely his birthday is different than mine. By the way, David, what is your birthday? 
26th November? Ah, he's not even close to my birthday, August the 18th. Well, of course, we sort of expected it would be different, didn't we? It's 364 over 365. Now, uh, what's the probability that Matt's birthday will be different from David's or mine? Well, let's see, that'll be something over 365. How many choices do we have for Matt's birthday if he's going to be different from us? 363. 363, okay, 363. By the way, Matt, what is your birthday? October the 14th. October the 14th. Okay, so so far we're, we're, everything's falling in line. Okay, now let's go to uh, Stephen. Stephen, let's see, the probability that your birthday is different from mine or David's or Matt's is some number over 365. What do you think that should be on top? 362. 362, sure, because every, every time we include a new birthday, we have to reduce the pool by one. By the way, what is your birthday, Stephen? December 31st. December 31st. Hey, a New Year's Eve kid. Okay, congratulations. Uh, okay, now, if we go to uh, Jeff back there, Jeff, I think you're going to be 361 over 365, and of course, we have to know what your birthday is. March 29th. March 29th. Okay, so um, of course, it's very likely that all of us have different birthdays, so you notice this product is still very big. And we come to Susan. Susan, what do you think I should put in the numerator of this next fraction? 360. 360, okay. And by the way, what is your birthday? March 26th. March, I don't think, we did have another March birthday here, I think we did, we? but not the 26th. Okay, now if I multiply these numbers together, this gives me the probability that all of our birthdays are different. Now, what if I take one minus that? This would be the probability that our birthdays are not all different. And that would be the probability, I'll just call it P, that at least two of us have the same birthdays. Now, if you multiply out all these fractions and subtract it from one, you have the probability that two of us share the same birthday. Now that number would be, of course, very small. The likelihood of the six of us having the same, uh, any two of us having the same birthday would be very small. Uh, Stephen's multiplying that out, I think, right now. Stephen, did you get an answer? Now there are pretty big numbers in fractional form. Do you want me to put oh, it in? Oh, uh, can you convert it to a decimal? Yeah, sure. Okay, I tell you what, we'll come back to Stephen in just a moment. What I want to point out is this. What if we put, brought one more person in the room? For example, we have Tony, the, the camera operator over here. Tony would put one more fraction on here, wouldn't we? And it'd be 359 over 365. And what do you think that's going to do to the product if I put one more fraction in there? Will it make this product larger or smaller? Smaller, because we're putting in a fraction that's still smaller than one. So what will it do to the difference if I put an extra fraction in there? It makes this fraction smaller, but when I take one minus that, it'll make it bigger. Because I'm taking away less, it'll make it bigger. Now here's the surprising result. If there had been 23 people in the room, and not just six of us, well, Tony, when we, when we went to Tony, there were seven. If there were 23 people or more, this expression, this difference, will be more than 0.5. Which means that if you have 23 people or more in the room, there's more than a 50-50 chance of two of you having the same birthday. So if you're at a party this weekend, and there are, you look around, and there are, hey, 23 people in the room, or, or more, you might say to someone, hey, I'll bet you two of us have the same birthday. And most people would say, no, I don't think that's going to happen. There's only 23 of us. But in the long run, if you do this repeatedly, more than half the time, two of you will have the same birthday. And of course, there could be lots of duplications. You could even have three people with the same birthday. But if there are 23 people or more, then the likelihood is better, the probability is more than one half of two of you having the same birthday. Now, how would you actually prove that after this, after this uh, episode is over? How would you actually prove this to yourself that 23 is all you need? You'd take one minus, and then how many of these fractions would you write down? 23. Well, not 23, because uh, you see, there were six people, but I only listed five fractions. That's because the very first person, I chose me, I just, I just said my birthday at random. And we didn't introduce the first fraction until we went to the second person. So if you write down 22 of these consecutive uh, fractions, subtract it from one, you'll find out that this number will end up being a little bit more than a half. And of course, as you put more people in the room, you put in more fractions, which makes this product smaller, which makes this difference bigger. Now, you know, most people, I think if you just asked them at random, how many people do you need in the room for two of us to have the same birthday, they'd say, well, let's see, half of 365 is what, 182, 183? But actually, if you have 180 some odd people in the room, there's a fantastically high chance that two of you have the same birthday. 
but 23 is the, is the, is the halfway point. Okay, so uh, try that at, at your next party. Let's go to the next graphic. Um, let's see, in this case it says, what is the probability that you correctly name three cards in order as they, as if they as are turned over from a well-shuffled deck of cards? Hey, I think we gotta try this. Okay, let me, let me make sure this is well-shuffled. Okay, no peeking here. Let's, let's come back to the uh, green board. And uh, I'm going to turn over three cards one at a time. I think the students can see this on the monitor if you go to the green screen. Uh, let's see. Uh, David, I'd like for you to name the first card I'm going to turn over. Let's see if he's psychic. Four clubs? Seven of clubs. Hey, it wasn't too far away. Okay, well, let's try one, another card. Um, what do you think? The next? Now, see, this time you could say four clubs again. You just don't want to say seven of clubs. Um, four of hearts. Four of hearts. Oh, ten of diamonds. Well, you know, we really didn't expect this was going to happen. Let's try somebody else. Matt, what do you think the next card's going to be? Ace of spades. Ace of spades. Oh, it's the deuce of hearts. So he was a long way away. Well, of course, it wasn't very likely that David and Matt were going to be able to name three cards in order as they were turned over. So how can we figure out what is the probability that this could have happened? And, and we expect this would be a very small number. Okay, so uh, I'm just going to call this P for probability, and on top I want to list the number of ways to name these, these cards correctly, but I'll try to economize on words here. The number of ways that we can name these cards correctly, and then we'll divide by the number of ways um, three cards can be shown. Now, you notice this is in order, so let me put in order below that. Now, that becomes very important in the, in the solution of the problem, because we have to be able to name the cards in order. So, when I work this out, you know, there's only one way that you can name the cards correctly as they come over. There's, you have to name the first card correctly, the second, and the third. But on the bottom, uh, would you say this is a permutation or a combination problem? Permut <coughs> permutation. It's going to be permutations, right. So uh, this is going to be P of 52, 3. Because there are 52 objects to choose from, and we're choosing three, and the order makes a difference. Now, if I had, if I had put combinations, then this would mean just turn three cards over together and see if somebody can name them, but in no particular order. So we're doing a permutation problem. This is 1 over, now let's see, we have a formula for permutations, that's 52 factorial divided by the difference factorial, that's 49 factorial, and that's going to be 49 factorial over 52 factorial when I invert and multiply, and that will be 1 over, now let's see, when I cancel, what numbers will be left in the denominator? 52 times 51 times 50. 52 times 51 times 50. Now, you know, 50 times 50 times 50 is about 125,000. 50 cubed is 125,000. This is going to be 1 over some number a little bit larger than 125,000. And, uh, Stephen, you're working this on your calculator. Mm -hmm. What did you get? 1 over 132,600. 1 over 32,600. Now what this means is, if we tried this, um, if we tried this 132,600 times, we would expect that only once would somebody be able to name the cards correctly in order. Okay, I think we just have to try this, don't you? Let's just, uh, let me shuffle these. And uh, let's just try this. So, uh, Susan, if you're going to name a card, what would you name? Four diamonds. Four diamonds. Oh, queen of diamonds. Well, you got the suit right. Okay, and uh, Jeff? Seven of clubs. Okay, now what if, I, what if instead of taking it off the top, what if I pull it out of the middle? Do you think that makes a difference? Yeah. Okay, why do you think it would make a difference? Um, is, is it any more likely that Jeff will be able to name the top card as opposed to the middle card? Not really. Yeah, so actually it doesn't matter. If someone says, oh, can I pick the one in the middle? Well, uh, so long as they're doing this randomly, it wouldn't matter, but I'll turn over the top card. By the way, you said what? Seven of clubs. Seven of clubs, ten of diamonds. Hey, we're getting closer to your diamond, Susan. And, uh, okay, Stephen, uh, shall you name a card? Mm -hmm. 
Three of clubs. Three of clubs, deuce of spades. Oh, sorry, no, no cigar. Um, and uh, so we didn't get any of them right. And of course, that is the most likely outcome that we wouldn't be able to name any of those cards correctly. Okay, uh, let's go back to that same graphic. Let's go back to the same graphic about uh, probability. And there was a second question on here. It says, what is the probability that the card, if the cards are not necessarily named in order, well, I think the answer there is instead of taking permutations, you'd take combinations in the denominator. So it'd be 1 over C, 52, 3, instead of 1 over P, 52, 3. And it ends up being slightly larger, but don't hold your breath. It's not a whole lot larger. Okay, let's go to the next problem, the last problem. And I think we only have time to briefly talk about this because we're almost out of time. So rather than working it out, let's just discuss the answer. It says, if you randomly guess answers on a 10-question true-false exam and passing is 70%, what is the probability that you pass the exam? Well, you know, we'd have to put uh, a ratio of two numbers. On the bottom, I'd put the number of ways that I could answer a 10-question true-false test. And we've actually talked about this problem before. Do you remember what that would be? It'd be 2 to the 10th power. Which is see if I can. Yeah, it's 1,024, right. Oh, let's see, that marker's not behaving very well, so let's try a different one here. Okay, now, um, in how could you pass the exam? Well, you have to get 70%, and this is a 10-question exam, so you have to get 7 out of 10 correct, or 8 out of 10 correct, or 9 out of 10 correct, or 10 out of 10 correct. Okay, now in how many ways can you, can, you, if, can you randomly pick the right answers to seven out of 10 questions? Well, I'll give you a hint. This is either a permutation or a combination problem. Do you think you'd want to choose permutations or combinations? Combinations. Combinations, because the order doesn't make a difference. So what we would do would be to pick the number of com combinations on 10 things taken seven at a time, plus the number of ways you could pick in 10 things C correctly pick eight at a time, or pick um, 10 things nine at a time, or the combination on 10 things 10 at a time. Of course, there's only one way to do, to do that. That would be them all right. So you'd have to figure how many ways can you get seven right, how many ways can you get eight right, nine right, or 10 right, where the order doesn't make a difference. You're just picking seven things out of 10, not in any particular order. Okay, well, if you add up those numbers and divide it by 2 to the 10th, you'll have the probability of passing the exam. I'll see you next time for the review for the final exam.